Good afternoon, everyone. How is everyone feeling after that networking session? Yeah? Excited? <laughs> well, that networking session couldn't be made possible without the fantastic help of our host, the Food Bites Company. Um, Nina Mayers, who is here on my right, is the Food Bites Platform Director at Rabobank. Nina, would you kindly join me on stage to share some words? Hi, everyone. Uh, really amazing energy in those sessions. I know it's been a long day, and uh, we learned a couple things on the, the food waste and loss side, which I'll talk about in a second, but we also learned that six people is the ideal group for like a group networking session. So for any of you that are like need that information for your lives, we, we tried it a couple different ways, and Sam and I came to that conclusion, and the groups, the groups agreed. Um, we also felt like they very much felt like SAT test, testing rooms, at least ours was very quiet, could hear a pin drop, but we'll take that as a sign that people were really putting a lot of energy into those um, cards. And uh, I, I guess all day I've been really impressed with um, the ingenuity of this group and I think like the sort of like lack of competition that folks have talked about a lot in this space, um, really like seeing everyone as a potential partner, um, everyone as a potential collaborator, and that really came out in the discussions that I sort of was a little fly on the wall for. Um, so. Uh, I guess our, my sort of key, key things that jumped out to me from those discussions were really a lot of talk about a culture shift. This has come up throughout the day, but really, you know, changing the culture around the value of waste um, and looking at it from a profitability standpoint rather than just a, you know, sustainability altruistic standpoint. And so from all different organizations, that was something that came up that like, how do we make this culture shift, shift happen? And really wanting to group think about that. Also data consistency. Um, I think that came up in like every conversation, like having consistent data throughout the value chain, being able to share it more. Um, so that again was seedlings of conversations were happening around that. Um, public and private partnerships, really wanting to see more and more and more of that happening, um, as well as just more funding, which I think Dana spoke to a lot this morning and heard it on a lot of panels. Um, and then like the last thing that just inspires me, I guess, is this idea of like food waste warriors um, and this kind of like highest and best use collaboration always coming into play. So I saw that a lot with people tackling waste or loss at different pieces of the value chain, but really thinking about how they could be collaborating with one another to get that food waste and loss to its highest and best use. Um, and then I think another thing too is like government enforcement as well as encouragement and like trying to find that balance, especially when it comes to regulation, pending regulation around waste. Um, and then the last thing I'll leave with, which was in my colleague Sonia's session, was um, I guess one group came to the consensus that, quote, we're going to change the world, which hopefully is something that a lot of people are feeling after being here and being a part of this. So those are my takeaways. Um, Nina from Food Bites by Rabobank. Uh, we are the innovation arm of one of the largest food and agriculture banks, and we're all about making sticky connections between startups, corporates, and investors who are at the forefront of sustainable food and ag innovation. So if you want to learn more, come talk to me or Trevor Seek or Sonia Shaker. And um, thank you to ReFed for bringing together this group of amazing people. Thanks. Well, thank you as well for facilitating that insightful session and allowing for connections to be curated. Now, I know it's been a jam-packed day so far, but hopefully you're finding it rewarding. I personally was part of the Jedi Fishbowl, and it was really great to hear that although we're talking about solving the food waste crisis, nothing can really happen if we do not address and acknowledge the inequities within our food system. Now, I'm excited to introduce our next session, Cultivating an Inclusive Food System by Exploring the Intersection of Justice and Food Waste. But before we kick us off, I'm gonna start us off with a couple of food facts of the day. The first one, during the pandemic, banana bread was a ubiquitous staple in every American household. I mean yours and yours and probably yours, but you could kind of call it the Vegas of food trends because what happens in the pandemic supposedly stayed in the pandemic. And number two, sustainability and justice are connected in part because injustice and environmental degradation are connected. And if we do not see the connections between the problems, 
we're unlikely to see how the solutions must be integrated. So, how do we move forward from here? We need to proactively ensure that not only are tables designed with everyone's inclusion from the get-go, but that food being served is culturally appropriate, that it's made available at times and locations that fit into busy schedules of people with multiple jobs and family demands, that it is affordable, that it can be accepted in a dignified manner, that the people behind the scenes who brought it to the table have a safe working environment and are fairly compensated for all they do, and so much more. We've also brought together some great panelists to share their thoughts on these topics, so I'll hand it over to them. And to kick, thing, to kick things off, I will welcome back Dana Gunders to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, I'm going to be so super fast because in um, being the resilient people that we are, we are uh, adapting our schedule a little bit this afternoon um, because we are so excited that after not one but two travel snafus, um, Stephen Satterfield made it here to join us. Um, and so uh, a couple things. One, um, I won't go into detail, but I do want to just mention that in addition to trying to give some air and stage to the Jedi discussion here today, um, REFED has been working really hard on a landscape assessment since our last summit, actually, um, that will come out in June. And rather than taking the time to go over it right now, just please stay tuned and know that um, we're aiming for late June to come out with some some thoughts after a whole um, interview and kind of landscape assessment process. Um, but I really want to uh, give the time over to our, our speaker and panel. So we're going to have Stephen take some time and, and say some words first, and then he'll invite the panel up. Um, it's possible it may run a few minutes past five as we've had to adjust. If you like desperately need a cocktail, then we will not stop you. Um, but uh, please, please stay for as long as you can. And with that, it is my um, sincere pleasure to introduce Stephen Satterfield. Um, I, I don't know Stephen as well as I would like to, but I have had the extreme pleasure of being able to chat with him um, a an handful of times. And I have also listened to his TED interview. When I did that, Honestly, it was like my heart rate dropped 10 beats and like the sun shined a little brighter. And so you guys are in for a real treat. Um, Steven is the host of Netflix High on the Hog. If you haven't seen it, you need to. Um, he is the founder of Whetstone Media and um, he's just an incredible spirit. So. Please welcome Stephen, and then he'll bring the panel up a little bit later on. All right. Always got to move the mic up. How's everyone doing? Well, I hope. Um, thanks for having me, Dana. Um, it's really a pleasure to be in a room full of food people thinking about very critical food issues. Um, it will definitely, I think, make the conversation uh, go easier. So um, I'll tell you a bit about myself before I tell you the things I believe in. Um, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. I'm a sixth generation AT alien. Um, yeah. Um, I got into food at a very early age in life as a teenager, mostly as a result of growing up around food. And food not just as a means of sustenance, but as a means of family and community, um, and ultimately understanding who I was. So um, I had a kind of non-traditional path um, as a young person, decided to go to culinary school uh, in Portland, Oregon, became a sommelier before my 21st birthday, 
Um, and yeah, I'll explain how that works later. Um, and basically fell deeply in love with the Willamette Valley wine industry and the business and world of food and wine at large. Um, I've had a really long and varied career in food, um, mostly working as a sommelier, a little bit of work as a social entrepreneur in South Africa and in the wine industry. And um, seven years ago, while I was working at a restaurant in San Francisco, actually, I think that's when, when I met Dana, um, I was uh, managing a place called Nopa, um, very popular restaurant um, in its heyday. This is maybe 10 years ago or so. And um, it was really an interesting time in that um, both social media um, and the way that we were able to share ideas um, was starting to change, along with really um, sort of who got to be a conventional gatekeeper in media. Um, that was an important time for me because it basically allowed me to, um, as a manager in a restaurant, get to broadcast our food community. Um, so I was a very early adopter on Instagram uh, under the restaurant's account um, and really began to understand media um, as a really critical means of helping people understand and connect to some of the most pressing challenges that we face as humans. But in terms of how um, the work that I do now came to be, it really came from my philosophy as a young sommelier, which was, if there's any wine people in the house, y'all all know that the word terroir is a word that is often used in the world of wine, for those who don't know the word. It's a way of talking about a system, a framework of agrarian inputs and human inputs that has uh, ultimately uh, defines what we taste and what we eat. In our case, the wine, but certainly it could be applicable to other types of fruits and vegetables as well. And the framework of terroir is very interesting because it is a universal language. I studied in Portland, Oregon, and one of the best things about being a sommelier is that you travel all over the world and you talk to other winemakers, you talk to other wine professionals, and you all talk about the terroir of where you're from or what you love. And it took me several years after leaving the wine business for me to fully appreciate the fact that I had learned a language that had allowed me to connect with people from the Republic of Georgia or Atlanta, Georgia where I'm from. And so I started to interrogate terroir as a means of understanding. What if we all understood each other through the perspective of another's terroir? The expansiveness for the basis of understanding is as limitless as learning about wine. No one will ever know it all. And in my day in the wine business, there were very few black people in the industry. One of the reasons I left the industry. And in reflecting on it years later, I thought how intellectually dishonest that we were able to develop this universal language and framework of understanding that we don't grant other people, our colleagues, our peers, or strangers. So terroir for me has been for many years now about a basis of understanding. And when I started Whetstone in 2017 as a print magazine, it was really in response to what was missing in media at the time. Um, this was, y'all are food people, you know, um, Bon Appetit's magazine, we had, um, a declining Savour magazine. This was after Gourmet had already gone out of business. Lucky Peach had gone out of business. Um, and in film and television, we had basically um, just the Food Network. And so all of what we were seeing in media was a very myopic expression of culture. It was diversity through the perspective of white people. 
white people as a proxy for other cultures. And only restaurants with European trained chefs deemed worthy enough to cover in mainstream media. So I started a media company that started as a print magazine, ultimately a podcast network. We got into film and television, and now we are actually representing a culinary talent roster of farmers and chefs from all over the country. But why, why? The reason why is simple. Our company, Whetstone, is dedicated to food origins or food anthropology, which is what the work that I put in the world is about. The utility of origin as a framework of understanding is the same as a historian uh, who purports that we can't understand where we're going without understanding where we've been. I agree with that. And so for me, origin is an ideology of reclamation. It is looking at the stories and the contributions that have been omitted and it is properly attributing and reinserting those individuals and those narratives that have been missing from our collective histories. And the stakes for this are high because if we were to explore the origins of food waste, what would we find? I know what we would find. We would find plantations. We would find out that the things that were created in excess were based on food being created for marketplaces. Plantations are not for feeding people. They are for marketplaces. So the ways in which the world began to trade food, commodities, humans, was a system of extraction, exploitation, degradation. It was also the system that gave us sugar, coffee, chocolate, and built the foundation of the agricultural system, the global food system, that we have all inherited today. So if we were to look at the dysfunction of the food system from the perspective of a food anthropologist, which I'm not, just self-proclaimed, I'm an origin forager, that's my language, so I am that, we would find out that this system has been broken actually for centuries. The problem is it's really hard to talk about. And the reason that it's hard to talk about is because even the word plantation creates a huge amount of discomfort. Black people don't wanna talk about plantations for reasons I think and hope are obvious. And white people don't wanna talk about plantations because it's deeply discomforting. And they want to know, what are the implications? Are you talking about me? And classically, I wasn't there. But we have all inherited the consequences and the repercussions of this global food system. So the panel that will happen in just a few minutes, we will talk about a number of different approaches to solving problems around waste or inequity in the food system. But from my perspective, the perspective of origin, we have to look at how we inherited the food system that we have today. And the same thing that is true for capitalism, right? It all stems from the plantation. And so what I would invite you all to think about, and you've heard a number of different beliefs, approaches, methodologies to solving very complicated problems, I would leave you with a consideration around the power of narrative from the perspective of origin, which is to say, there is nothing more powerful in the world than stories. That's the most powerful form 
of any kind of power that exists. Because all of the things that plague us come from stories that are told and then perpetuated. We know that stories are powerful. We see examples of stories being powerful because we see how hard power works to protect the story. So for instance, if you were to um, consider that um, right now in the state of Florida and possibly as a national party platform, there have been real re dramatic reductions to what we are allowed to learn in school, especially as it relates to people who look like me. The reason for this from a historical perspective and as an origin forger is pretty clear. The story lies in the power. How do we learn stories from our families, from our schools, from our churches, from our communities? Who's the publisher? Who's the editor? Who's the author? When you're reading stories, there are people who are missing from those stories. And it is all of our jobs to find those people who are missing because they were there. And not only were they there, they contributed massively to the society that we all have inherited, good and bad. We were all there. So I am not trying to be a buzzkill. What I am trying to do is to give you a little of my perspective from the point of origin, from the point of terroir, and to invite you to think about who is missing from the stories that you tell, that you absorb. Do you ever question or push back on the stories that you, that you hear? Does it depend on the narrator? An exploration into omission is revelatory and it will tell you who has the power and where the power lives based on who was omitted from the story. Thank you very much. And I believe that um, I will now be inviting the panelists on stage. Um, so Catherine, Marco, Rajaj, and Kashi, if you all want to come on up and join me, and Marco. Yes, okay, there we go. Okay, so um, as I guess somewhat of an extrapolation, a continuation of that little diatribe from me, um, we have a number of speakers on stage who have a broad, uh, well this really represents a broad cross-section of solutions, right, to equity, inclusion, access in the food system. Um, I just shared a little bit about my own worldview um, and how to solve these complex problems. Um, but maybe we can start uh, with you, Kashi, and talking about sort of what your worldview is as it relates to the challenges of uh, food waste and food systems access. Sure. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the end of the day. Um, Okay, so as we think about it at Brataza, <clears throat> thinking about equity, Vanessa mentioned it earlier, I think you can't talk about 
being fair without talking about sustainability. And that's a big part of what we do at Rataza, thinking about food waste, thinking about food systems, thinking about our hungry and pulling all of these entities together in a cohesive way. Um, as we think about sustainability and what that word means to us as a business, to me, that is a system that exists and persists in a stable way long into the future. But I don't think a system can exist without people. And people are at the center of these systems that we're talking about, our stakeholders, who are we serving? Mm -hmm. So being inclusive of them, as you were mentioning just now, how do we include our stakeholders in the process. We're not doing anything, nobody in this room is doing anything to someone, right? We're not serving someone without their input. We shouldn't be. How do we know what people really need help with? What our farmers really need help with? We serve our farmers, they inform what solutions we pull together. We are paying farmers a fair price for the food that they can't sell. We're creating a dignified solution. We heard them, we listened to them. What is important to them? What are the cultural values? What, what norms are they dealing with in their small towns and their societies? Um, and then we go back and create solutions that really help them and don't create ripple effects. So <clears throat> a sustainable solution that also isn't just helping the environment and helping us as stakeholders and the planet, but how are we helping small towns and small farmers persist and exist long into their futures, and how do we help these communities thrive as a solution that we can create, but at the same time helping our hungry? How do we help nonprofits, many of you in the room that are doing this incredible work, how can we create a solution that also helps nonprofits exist and thrive long into the future to help people that we need to be helping? And how do we help them? So I, I wanna come back to that yeah. question because um, I think a lot of us are gonna talk about people um, and the question of how sort of is the question. Yeah. So I, I do want you sure. to hold that, that thought um, and I'm going to invite you, Catherine, um, to talk about um, your work at Plentiful and um, what I'm assuming is sort of a, a tech and data approach, right, to solving some of these challenges. Yeah, thank you. And Nice to be here. I'm Catherine. She, hers, uh, with Plentiful, and we're building um, what we like to say are people-first technology solutions. So we're thinking about easy ways for people who are food insecure to access the resources that they need, as well as providers to be able to manage their services and be able to do that in a way that's offering an improved customer-client experience. And we think about justice and equity a lot, we use the word dignity, and we pull people into the designing of technology solutions so that we're really having the voice of people who are food insecure at the table with us as we're designing our technology solutions so that they're just not receiving something. And um, one of the really unique things about Plentiful, it's our organization's name, it's also our kind of flagship technology product. Um, it's one of the only tools that's really in the hands of people who are food insecure and actually connecting them directly to resources, which is, um, you know, we, we know we have a lot of work to do on the dignity, equity, justice front, but um, it's one, one step in a direction that we hope will be impactful. Great, thanks. Um, and Marco is here uh, from the city of Baltimore. Do you want to uh, talk more? Yeah, yeah, you've got Baltimore in the house. Um, do you want to talk about um, your work with the city uh, from the perspective of environmental justice or kind of around this larger thesis? Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Marco Merrick, and I'm the Chief of Equity and Environmental Justice for DPW. That's the, the Department of Public Works for Baltimore City, which is the city's largest agency. and. First off, I, I live in a place of almost apology because before going to that agency and to do the work that I do around equity and environmental justice, I took for granted what I'd been having all my life wherever I was in terms of water, clean water, 
running water, for bathing, for cooking, for whatever, for wasting it even. And then to have folk who come daily, weekly, all of my life to move solid waste, to take my recyclables. And so I'm always thanking our employees and, and apologizing for taking it for granted because what I know now when we talk about essential employees is that if our system goes down, if DPW goes down, every resident, every hospital, every school, every restaurant, anything and everything that lives, works, does business in Baltimore will not function. On the other side of equity and environmental justice, equity for me really symbolizes change. Equity is about fairness. It's about shifting power dynamics to places of disenfranchisement and pain and making decisions when we look at, and, and you really taught, Stephen, you touched on something that's so important, and I certainly am not a medical professional at all, but to understand how we help others, how we fix the things that are wrong if we are ill, we have to go to the root of the problem. Mm -hmm. We can certainly uh, provide medication or something that will address symptoms, but not really get to the root. And to be in a place like Baltimore, which is the birthplace of redlining, and then very proudly we can say that it's the oldest water filtration system in the nation. Abel Wollman established water filtration in Baltimore more than 100 years ago, and many water systems around the country and around the world are modeled after Baltimore. We have some of the best water in the country, but we have some of the most expensive water in the country, which means that everybody does not have equal access to that or it's not affordable. What does that mean in a place where you have and you have not very clearly? How do we provide access to, but then how do we look at the root of what has established have and have not? You cannot address this and not look at what the plantation was and what the plantation is now and how we live in places where when we have these conversations, it is not lost on me to have this conversation. I am speaking from a place of privilege because those who are not aware of how we cultivate, how we perpetuate, how we live in places of degradation, and the environment is more than water. It's more than our solid waste. It is food deserts. It's uh, underfunded schools. It's lack of education. It's lack of access. So. When I'm talking about environmental justice, I really am addressing the injustices that inform our environment. And I'll talk about later on, perhaps, mm -hmm. the steps that we're taking intentionally mm -hmm. in places of pain and from our places of privilege to address food insecurity, to address our irresponsibility with how we waste, how we could literally obliterate hunger mm -hmm. with what we waste every day. Okay, and yes, story is so much a part of that. I want to come back to that. And Rajesh, um, you want to talk about your perspective on all this? Thank you, Stephen. Firstly, how do you follow Marco, right? That was incredible. <laughs> Can we just give everyone a cocktail now, <laughs> maybe? <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Rajesh Merchandani. I joined Feeding America a handful of months ago, Chief Communications and Community Engagement Officer. It's my first refed conference. I'm really pleased, really honored to be amongst all of you. And... I haven't been with Feeding America very long. What I've learned and what I see is that, you know, food banking started with food rescue, an attempt to stop food being wasted and put it to its, what we think is its highest and best use, which is feeding people. How do you know how you should get that to people? How do you know what they want? You ask them and a couple of People on the panel and you yourself talked about this as well. Uh, I, I was going to tell you a really interesting story about cheese, but actually, I'm going I'm to tell you that story. Okay, at some yeah, because we want that story, I think. But I want to tell you a story. I actually want to tell you a story about mobile pantries. Many of you will know here. Many of you did it. During the pandemic, mobile pantries really took off. They were such a lifeline for communities who couldn't get out of their homes and needed food. In Washington, D.C., where I'm based, the Capital Area Food Bank there now still operates mobile pantries, and in fact, the Feeding America Network operates a very large number of mobile pantries. But I want to tell you this story about Washington, D.C. So they had these mobile pantries, and they were saying, okay, we can fit a finite amount of food 
on these and send them to communities that we know have very few other options because they're in food deserts or whatever. So how, but how do we limit what people are getting from the food pantries? Because there's no dignity in that. We want the experience to be like going to a supermarket. You get what you want, right? So they asked the people they serve. We call them neighbors because it reminds us that food insecurity is just around the corner for everyone. So many people are affected by it. They asked their neighbors, and the neighbor said, you know what, don't put a, a, a note on the shelf saying you can only take two bags of this. You wouldn't see that at a supermarket. Here's what we think. Make the mobile pantries on these days for seniors first. Seniors, some of the most marginalized communities when it comes to food insecurity, right? And so they did that. And so seniors were able to go to the mobile pantries because they were closer to where they lived. They could get there and they could get the food they needed. Even the people who themselves didn't have enough were saying, I want to help because these people need it more. That's the kind of amazing sort of community spirit that really inspires me in this work. And I see it in this room as well. And it just reminds us that no one wants to end hunger more than the people who tackle it every day. And no one knows better how to do that. They're the ones with the expertise. So we need to center them. Definitely. So I'm, I, I want to sort of push us all further along around these different approaches. And this is why I really love sort of food as a medium, because it really quickly puts us in an intersectional space, right? Because it, we all have to deal with it in a way that other ideolo um, ideolo ideologies don't really force us to kind of all come from the same perspective or there's more room for us to kind of, you know, be divergent in our ideas. As I led with though, I really believe that a lot of the challenges that we all face in trying to solve these problems is just around building um, much like climate, right? The fervor among consumers, among people um, to really understand the stakes of all of the various crises that are happening in the food system from access to waste, also environment and climate. So are, I'm curious, are there news stories that can be told, um, whether it's about people or approaches to and through technology or uh, city and private partnerships um, and, and same for the, the sort of nonprofit sector. Are there stories that we can hold on to either that you all are yourselves furthering or that you have seen in your own work that, that you can draw from? And I know this isn't sort of a sanctioned question, but I'm looking for kind of optimism. I'm looking for things that um, we can talk about um, as kind of a new narrative to build. You're looking at me. I am looking okay. at you. All right. Um, I'm, this is not the time for the cheese story either. Okay. But I will tell you the Over story. Over drinks. I will, I will tell the cheese story. I promise. I'm allowed to. Um, this is a time for a story about bison and about squash, if I may. Okay. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> so let me just back up and just set the, set the table a little bit for this. Why are we on this stage right now? Why are we having this conversation? Because food insecurity discriminates and it is the product of discrimination. Communities of color face food insecurity at rates almost three times as high as the national average. We're trying to do what we can to address that. And Kashi, maybe you've had this experience too. And this is the cheese story, actually. In terms of food rescue, food sourcing, we're often limited by what's donated. So a quick deviation to the cheese story, seeing as I've whet your appetite on this now. Cheese, when it's like wrapped up in supermarkets, it's these nice little blocks, right? And there's so much that's cut off the trimmings that often goes to waste. So we partnered with Maple Ridge Foods to get huge amounts of these offcuts 
And then we partnered with processors, and we shredded the cheese, and we made it into family-sized bags, and we were able to supply seven million pounds worth of cheese in a handful of years that this program has been going on to neighbors who needed it all over the country. And the important thing here is not only being able to rescue that food, not only making sure it's nutritious food, but that we were able to use our distribution system, which comprises the 200 food banks that make up the Feeding America network and the 60,000 partner agencies, meal programs, food pantries that are operating in every zip code. And when I joined the company, I almost, I almost fell off my chair when I heard that because that's an extraordinary scale. And we used that distribution to make sure that we could get that nutritious cheese to neighbors in need wherever they needed it because they couldn't often get it. But that's a rare example of being able to get large amounts of nutritious food like that donated. So we augment our efforts through our purchasing strategy and through our distribution strategy. The mobile pantries example, we now are still investing in areas. So we'll see, okay, we've got this large amount of rescued food. Where's the nearest food bank? Where are the nearest pantries? But where's the need? Where are the communities, either rural communities or communities of color that really need this food? And we'll stand up mobile pantries in those areas. And then we'll go from mobile pantries to brick and mortar pantries to make sure that our distribution strategy includes an equity lens. And then the bison story, just to come back to this, very quickly, I can see you thinking, when is he gonna shut up? No, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for the bison okay, story. Okay, the though. bison story, it's coming now. In Wisconsin, the State Association of Food Banks with partners set up a tribal elders food box program. Mm -hmm. You can see where this is going, Con. Mm -hmm. Tribal elders amongst the most marginalized and most food insecure communities in our country, but they're still in our country, they're still people here. So they put together these boxes, about 1,500 boxes distributed up to two times a month, and then filled with produce and food that was culturally connected and relevant. Bison meat, mm -hmm. elk meat in some cases, squash, berries, uh, wild rice. And then the elders came back and said, can we have more of the bison? Can we have more of the squash? Can we have more berries? Can we have more uh, herbs like bergamot? No one's donating bergamot, I'm assuming. So the f using our purchasing strategy, we were able to help provide culturally relevant food. And the best thing is that half of it was sourced from indigenous growers as well. So we were investing back in those communities as well. Communities of need. Mm -hmm. So that's another way of applying the equity lens. And uh, yes, it looks like Marco wants to say something. Uh, and also Catherine wants to say something maybe attached to that, maybe about story, I'm not sure. Um, I, I did see Catherine first and then I'll come right to you, Marco. Thanks. Um, yeah, I do want to build off of this um, story. My story doesn't have a food to it, unfortunately, um, which I know is always a little bit more exciting to hear. But um, at Plentiful, we think about data a lot because what we're trying to do is center the individual and think about how do you get resources to people and resources that they want so that you can go into a, a food bank or a food pantry and have it be a complete choice. That to us is a, a big part of um, dignity. And you know, if you think about impact metrics right now, it's pounds of food moved or number, number of meals served, which really doesn't tell you much about that food. There's also metrics around number of food banks and food pantries and number of people who are food insecure. And these are helpful on some level, but it really keeps us at like a 10,000 foot level. We don't really know much about individuals. And a big part of that is because there aren't that many tools that are built that are in the hands of people who are food insecure or in food pantries that are on the ground at the problem level kind of really looking at it. So our our view is is pretty high. And it it's you know really hard to think about equity and justice when you don't have kind of a, a granular look at who's food insecure and what their needs are, how many people are in their household, you know. What does their kitchen look like? What are their dietary preferences? Do they have some medical needs they should be addressing or just foods that they prefer to eat? So hopefully Plentiful will start to kind of gather some data to move the resource allocation in the direction of thinking more about people. And one of the things that, you know, as we were 
So, you better sorry to interrupt. Anything. I'm just trying to make sure that we, I'm, I'm, is the data the story? Are the numbers the story? Yeah, there's a data point here. Okay, yeah. okay. So we were, we're expanding from New York City to, to Denver and getting plentiful in the hands of people who are food insecure. And one of the things that we heard from many potential users on the ground in Denver was the food pantry they were at was the only one they knew about. And there might be one closer to their home or one closer to their work or school or what have you, but that there's this very big disconnect between people who are food insecure and the resources that are out there. So when we think about shifting the narrative and telling a different story, it's one that's really driven by people who are food insecure and what their needs are. Let's talk afterwards because my colleague Mark sitting over there from our IT department is helping to run something called Service Insights, which is a platform that gathers a lot of some of the data that you're talking about right now. There it is. Um, we'll go Marco and then we'll come right to you. Yeah, so mine yep. is back to a place of equity mm -hmm. and hearing just the example of the cheese, just the cheese alone, which is representative of so much more. Two questions, they both begin with who. Who knew, who knows, who cares? It's reprehensible that we waste to that measure but we don't know. And those who know don't care. What has informed a nation that does not really care about wasting while we have those who need? Mm -hmm. And so that's the real work, the very intentional work that we have to do when we look at budgets. Look at the recovery money mm -hmm. that was really disseminated, but where did it go? Those who really needed it, did it really land there in terms of in, in, in capacity? So when we ask these hard questions, we, it's indicting because our budgets are moral documents. So our budgets around food waste are about whether it's composting or recycling or, or raising up programs. And we do in, in, in watershed planning and partnerships, which has nothing to do with food waste. Yes, it does. Because if we're good stewards over how we manage water systems and how we take care of how we irrigate our, our lands in Baltimore and how we take care of that which goes into the Chesapeake Bay, the largest estuary in the country, then we are enabling food in a way that we should not be wasting it and are responsible. These are intentional equity steps that we take. Love Hard that. questions There's to ask, and they're painful if you go to what the real source. For is. all of us, yeah, a, a lot of implications there. I'll just add a really quick story. Uh, one of the entities that can really help this whole landscape, we think, Rataza thinks, are businesses. And businesses can move food at scale, can buy food at scale in a way that we want to help individuals. So I think we can also do that with business being a tool for good. So just a quick story. You told a story about cheese. You also mentioned squash. On Friday afternoon, this past Friday, at 2 o'clock, I got a call from one of our farmers. Um, who said he had a 53-foot truck full of zucchini that he could not sell. It's like almost 50,000 pounds of zucchini. That sounds about right. Yeah, like who's bought, I mean, one pound of zucchini is like way more than you would ever use for dinner. So um, we had to figure out what to do with 50,000 pounds of zucchini on a Friday afternoon, like everything's shutting down. Um, and because we have built an uh, infrastructure that's inclusive of many different types of stakeholders, we were able to go to our nonprofit partners and say, okay, we have like a lot of zucchini, do you need any? So we placed pallets with food banks and um, all over the state. Um, but then we called our business partners and we said, hey, we know that you care about food waste and that you care about the environment. We've got this situation. Would you be willing to take this? And we've come up with a program. I know some of you are doing it, but produce as a benefit. So they were like, yeah, we'll give it to our employees. And so we were able to use different kinds of partnerships to think about how to move this food in a way that was really useful. And we're helping businesses think about what health and health and wealth, right? Uh, wellness for their employees actually means, right? It's not just a gym membership. It's like, how do you actually nourish their bodies? Mm -hmm. So yeah, there are different ways to think about these issues um, and different ways to use 53 foot containers of zucchini. 
So yeah. can, can I just? I think that's such a work. great. We pay the farmer a fair price for that entire container load, right? So there are ways to do that too. Amazing. That's such a great example because it just reminds me of what Dana said this morning on the stage. We're not competing against each other. We're competing against the problem, which is food waste and hunger. That's such a great example of saying, picking up the phone and saying, we've got this. It's not, well, you shouldn't have that. We should have that. It's you've got it. How can you get it to the people who need it and who can help us get it, get it there? Yeah, you can't I'll do it through partners unless you have partners. Yeah, it's. I mean, the, again, the scale of the problem sort of demands it. I am interested, though, Kashi, as you started to talk about scale, and this is through the context of business, um, there are elements of food waste that feel a little antithetical to, like, regular business, right? Like, not competing, for instance. And so um, I'm wondering um, to what degree, um, like, the scale or the business really is what you all are, are thinking about. In other words, like for instance, um, it, it seems to me that we kind of have like a last mile problem, right? Like listening to you talk about Feed America um, in the same way that a company like maybe FedEx has a, a last mile problem, right? It's about getting access into the nooks and crannies of our communities. So, and that's an expensive problem, right? For, um, I mean, they actually have to, sort of use our, our government and our own mail carriers to, to solve that problem. I'm curious around distribution or scale or just sort of normal business dynamics, um, how are you all thinking about, um, you know, how to grow your impact or possibly how to grow your bottom line as a means of solving this problem? And is there any tension there at all? I'll just jump in as the for-profit. Um, I think, as I said, business can be a tool for good, but we make money to reinvest it back into our stakeholders. Um, yes, inherently business has competition. We want to grow. We want to be the biggest and the best, but we don't want to do it at the expense of others. Uh, we want to do it with others. I know that feels weird, so as we think about funding and like how do we raise money and do all the things you do as a business, you know, maybe that becomes a harder conversation with investors and things like that. Uh, but I'm more focused on our client partners and how do we bring people into the solution to be part of the solution. Um, so yes, like we want clients, um, but if somebody else is a better fit because they have a program that is going to work better, please work with them. You know, it, we really are all in this together. If we were talking earlier, uh, if I put myself out of a job because all of you are doing great work and like we have no more food waste, amazing. I can go sure. do something else, right? Yeah, I mean that that's not really like a bottom line. Right? It's a different bottom line. It is, right? But It's I, the right bottom line to me. To us, I think. I agree with you, but it's interesting. Yeah. Um, anyone else want to want to add to that? No. We're we're not a for-profit. We're a non-profit. Um, and we think about though kind of we we refer to ecosystem alignment, so thinking about, you know, you have food insecure individuals, food pantries, food banks, and then stakeholders, you know, municipalities, large food organizations, Feeding America. There isn't a lot of coordination amongst them. So our incentive is how do we think about sharing information? This is where data comes in so that there's better coordination and movement amongst um, different layers of the system so that it can function very differently. Scaling. So ours is, of course, a service agency, mm -hmm. but what we recognize in the city or in any place, the work that we do is essential, but what we do, we cannot do alone. Mm -hmm. We cannot be successful alone, so we partner with other city agencies. We partner with our institutions, and to have, to have a Morgan State University that cranks out engineers, you know, left and right, but to have for us a connection to the community, because one of the things that is so important is trust. And when you can communicate with your customers, with your stakeholders, in a way that fosters trust. So we have enabled a resident advisory committee, which meets with our director and our executive leadership team once a month. 
And while we, of course, are providing service around water and solid waste, but to understand what's happening in the community. So there are individuals from all of the council manic districts. They are not elected officials. They are not appointed by elected folk. These are residents. These are community leaders or folk who are not leaders in their communities. And to understand where they are and to meet them where they are so that if, in fact, food insecurity is an issue in that community, while we are still water and solid waste, to understand what that looks like and to connect them with partner agencies or connect them with the School of Community Health and Policy at Morgan that has programs and has resources. These are the kinds of relationships and the kinds of collaborations that are important for the work that we do. Scaling through collaboration, definitely. Um, I think we, I don't know if I was supposed to do like an actual Q&A. Sorry if I was, I, but I do think that we probably have time for like one question. Um, no cheese story? Oh, I mean. No more cheese? No more? I told you I think, cheese yeah, story. we, Tell I think. Tell another one. No. Okay, actually I do have a, I have a red rice story. Okay, <laughs> well, I think, I don't see any hands up, so I think we're clear. Maybe we'll do uh, red rice and then if there's a question we can end can, it. Can I just offer a comment to the last round of, of course. comments? Because I think it's that's, your stage. this idea of scale, this idea of last mile is really important. And I just want to kind of concur with what my colleagues here have talked about partnerships. You know, we try and make the process of food rescue and food sourcing as frictionless as possible. So my colleagues created an app called Meal Connect, which allows donors to post amounts of food that they want to donate. And then the nearest food bank gets automatically pinged. And that, that is the taking the friction out of donation. And we, in the, in the what, nine years, I think, Meal Connect has been running, we've just passed five billion pounds of food rescued. And actual fact, it's really kind of running at pace now. We're, we're basically doing a billion pounds of food rescued a year through Meal Connect. That's taking the friction and that's going to scale. It's amazing. You know, I'm really proud of my colleagues. Um, but then we have to think that's when we apply the equity lens. How do we get that to the people who need it most? And that's where the distribution comes in. That's where the partnerships come in. Because as everyone has said, you know, I'm talking big numbers. Last year, the Feeding America Network rescued 3.8 billion pounds of food. That's crazy. But let's just put that into context. We served 38 million people last year, food pantries and food banks. That's one in six of the population. That is the scale of the problem. And then let's think of the scale of the opportunity. 3.8 billion pounds worth of, uh, 3.8 billion pounds of food rescued. Add all the amazing work everyone in this room is doing, add the amazing work that this entire sector is doing, there's still so much out there. There's a reason that the great guys at FarmLink called their film Abundance. There is so much out there. We've got to think about the opportunity, and the only way we can really leverage that opportunity is by partnering. We want to partner wherever it's feasible to make sure that we can get as much food to as many people as needed, and to divert it from landfills as well. All right. I think that's a great note to end on, personally. And um, if there are those interested in partnering, you can network, I think, over drinks if we've reached that part of the show. Stephen, um, I, I, I don't want to leave without acknowledging, certainly Baltimore's here, and, and the work that we do in the trenches because Information and education are very important. Please. And we have ambassadors that do that in terms of teaching folk about composting, about recycling, or whatever it is that hurt, really helps us in terms of sustainability. Mm -hmm. And then to raise our own awareness as to how we can proactively and individually and intentionally enable what we think would be progress around food waste and around, uh, around food intelligence. and and being very prudent about what we do. So I thank these, these, these gentlemen and folk like them in Baltimore that are doing that. Once again, Baltimore, stand up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
really grateful for you all. Hopefully there was something in there of inspiration, of action, and um, I think I'm turning it over now. Can we please give them another round of applause? Now, I do have to share my favorite author, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, always says that there is a danger in a single story. It robs people of dignity and it robs people of visibility. And in a country synonymous with abundance, I urge you all to find the plethora of stories to better serve the communities within your reach. But before we do so, I know you're all itching for a cocktail. So I'm excited to announce and that you are all invited to a happy hour reception on 18th floor at the Gateway East. For those of you who are here and joining us virtually, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow and we'll raise a toast in your spirit. And, at, um, and for those of you who are here in person, we invite you to connect, to further connect with people people who are not within your sector, um, just continue to share the stories that are starting here. It all, it's, it all starts with one step. And be sure to take part in the Summit Scavenger Hunt if you haven't already. There is a QR code behind your badge. Please, please do so. You will win, you will win a chance to win free registration at next year's Summit. And who knows, we might actually find out what happened with the cheese story. I'm looking at you. <laughs> but before you go upstairs, be sure to grab a bag from Too Good To Go on your way out. For those who are not familiar with Too Good To Go, they offer a markdown alert app that lets users order food at risk of going to waste at a discounted price. And for this summit, they're providing surprise bags featuring a range of items left over from our meals to make sure that nothing goes to waste. I guess we'll see you back here tomorrow morning, bright and early at breakfast at 8 a.m. Thank you all again for joining us today.